start yes uh, good evening all and welcome to one more webinar from neurocritical care society of india as you all know the neurocritical care society of india was launched in 2020 during the snac 2020 conference at uh, uh, mahabalipuram chennai uh, after that the neurocritical care society of india has always been participating in the academic activities as well as the administrative activities of neurocritical care across India. So as a part of that and also the classroom which we had initiated earlier in the 2017 in association with SNAG has been continuing to have the academic classes. So in association with classroom and NCSI, we have been having now every uh, two Saturdays of every month some academic classes, maybe a journal club, an uh, important uh, uh, article or the guidelines or some of the important topics which we need to discuss uh, as a part of this. So today we have Anag who is working in Kim Sunshine, Sunshine Hospital as a consultant neuroanesthesia and uh, neurocritical care. He'll be talking to us on multimodal monitoring in patients with TBI in neuro ICUs. As we all know that uh, multimodal monitoring is uh, has, has been increasing all over the world and it has led to uh, drastic improvement in the morbidity and mortality of the patients. So over to you, Anag, and you will enlighten us on these uh, monitorings, multimodal monitorings. Over to you, Anag, and welcome to right. the show. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Dr. Anag Chakravarti. I work in Hyderabad as a consultant in uh, neuroanesthesia. Uh, quick uh, uh, disclaimer from my side that uh, since I've joined this hospital, the critical care uh, team is separate and I work only as a neuroanesthetist. So some of these uh, techniques I am not practically familiar with. Some of the routine techniques I am, but some of the uh, other ones are mostly theoretical. So that disclaimer being told, I can, I think, uh, go ahead and start. Uh, right, sir. So my topic, as sir uh, described, is multimodality monitoring in ICU for traumatic brain injury patients. So we will go through how to interpret these uh, modalities, what combinations can be used and how we can develop some algorithms uh, to predict what would be the uh, next step. So uh, this management of uh, TPI is based on the prevention of secondary injury. I'm assuming the people already know what is uh, secondary injury. So secondary injury follows primary injury in a matter of minutes, hours or days. So primary injury being uh, the trauma which leads to the hematoma and secondary injury may be due to uh, the, the, uh, the factors which are um, time dependent uh, can be due to the cerebral factors or the systemic factors which cause the um, uh, secondary injury to take place. So uh, the management is based on um, preventing this secondary brain injury. So multimodality uh, monitoring, it assesses multiple aspects of cerebral, uh, cerebral physiology and guides the intervention. So as no single neuromonitor will be able to identify comprehensively, we have to use it as uh, as combinations or one after the other in, in using several variables. So the what, what modalities we generally use is clinical monitoring and imaging, intracranial pressure and derived indices, several blood flow, several oxygenation, brain metabolism and biochemistry and electrophysiology. So we'll go through them quickly one by one. So we'll come to the clinical monitoring, like often ignored part. So what we can do is to monitor the patient clinically, we generally use GCS to uh, classify the severity of TBI, um, uh, 13 or above being mild and, uh, and eight, uh, 9 to 13 being moderate and uh, 8 and below being uh, severe. So uh, GCS, as we know, has several limitations. The verbal response cannot be assessed in intubated patients. Brainstem function is not tested. And a GCS of 3 may cover a large spectrum of brain injury. So to uh, um, address these problems, so we have adopted a pupillary reactivity score with the GCS. So we call it as GCSP. So GCS uh, is measured usually and pupil reactivity score is calculated, which means the number of non-reactive pupils. So this number of non-reactive pupils may be 0, 1 or 2. And this pupillary reactive, uh, re reactivity score is subtracted from the GCS to get a more accurate picture. Another scoring system what is used in gaining uh, traction slowly is called as the four score. It is called as the full outline of unresponsiveness score and it has uh, components such as eye, motor, brainstem and respiratory functions and it uh, overcomes some limitations of the GCS. You can see the four score uh, on the right. So it has the eye, motor, brainstem reflexes which are not tested in GCS 
and respiration which is uh, not assessed in gcs so it gives up another uh, outlook apart from that the uh, uh, muscle power grading also needs to be uh, kept in mind so uh, for clinical monitoring there will be deep sedation and use of muscle relaxants which will prevent us to get a accurate clinical assessment sedation holds which are usually performed in the icu may or may not be allowed in the uh, uh, case of a raised icp and hence a neurological examination cannot be done so clinical examination may not be able to determine all the ch uh, changes in the icp or in the intracranial uh, pathology alone so it has to be used along with uh, other monitoring modalities so apart from uh, neuro uh, monitor uh, as in the clinical monitoring of the neurological system other systemic variables also need to be kept in mind uh, our usual monitors uh, along with the arterial blood pressure central venous cardiac output temperature abg etc we can use along with the uh, monitoring of the uh, neuro system so coming next to the uh, imaging studies so the most uh, common or the most preferred modality is the non contrast ct it is used because of its uh, ease of accessibility speed and sensitivity to hemorrhage so using the non contrast ct we can have a scoring system such as marshall classification and the rotterdam scores and they determine the severity of um, the traumatic brain injury so they generally i'm not going into the details of that but generally what they look at is the compressed or absent of the basilar cystins presence of subarachnoid hemorrhage a presence of a significant midline shift up to 5 mm or more than 5 mm and presence of intracranial hemorrhagic lesions such as epidural or subdural hematomas or contusions so apart from non contrast ct we have also have perfusion ct perfusion ct is one of the newer parameters in which a contrast injection is uh, uh, done for the uh, patient and assessment of cerebral blood volume cerebral blood flow and mean transit time is taken so this detects whether the normal perfusion of the brain or if it's hyperemic and it is associated with an outcome so depending on the perfusion ct characteristics mri in the case of traumatic brain injury we have certain sequences which can help us uh, in detecting uh, uh, diffuse axonal injury dti is used susceptibility weighted images can pick up micro hemorrhages magneto encephalography can pick up slow waves which are uh, associated with uh, a poor um, um, Uh, neurological recovery and it comes from the white matter fiber tracts or axonal shear injury and functional mri it depends on the blood oxygen level and can demonstrate uh, whether cerebral function uh, is adequate or not in that uh, brain region according to the blood flow to that region so apart from these generally we don't use it as a continuous we cannot use it as a continuous mode of monitoring because it gives us only a snapshot of the brain and uh, every time we have to ship the patient to an um, uh, imaging suit there is always a risk that there something might happen during the shifting so it is again has to be used in conjunction with certain other monitors so what other monitors now we come to the main monitoring modalities we come to intracranial pressure monitoring and derived indices so icp when we are monitoring it allows us to measure icp the absolute value of icp using the formula that cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure we can measure the cerebral perfusion pressure also we can use the cerebral uh, sorry the intracranial pressure waveform for waveform analysis and we can use the again the waveform and the this waveform analysis to assess the auto regulatory status so there are two types generally of um, icp monitoring one can be the ventricular catheters and others will other is the micro transducing uh, systems so ventricular catheters generally we call it as the evd here generally it is placed in the frontal on the non dominant side a, a bur hole is placed and the catheter is passed into the lateral ventricle so uh, the um, uh, system is zeroed at the tragus and the uh, limit is set by the surgeon as to how much the uh, drain can be emptied so the advantage of this uh, ventricular catheters is that it is generally low cost it is accurate reliable and allows the therapeutic drainage of csf in a uh, patient who has very high icp the disadvantages is that it is generally it is not used to obtain a continuous icp uh, there is difficulty in placing it if there is a very severe uh, cerebral edema and the ventricle is collapsed mm, there is high chance of hemorrhage in the tract high chance of infection and frequently it can get occluded with blood and blood products so to overcome these uh, shortcomings we have the micro transducer uh, equipments which are uh, the devices which use 
different technologies such as strain gauge principle, uh, fiber optic device and pneumatic sensor, which is present at the tip of these uh, uh, transducer devices, which will measure the ICP. So the strain gauge, uh, it measures the uh, pressure around a uh, wheatstone bridge and uh, the pressure which causes conformational change in the resistivity of the wheatstone bridge. And that is that change is uh, identified as the amount of pressure that is being exerted. So uh, the Codman micro sensor uh, is the most commonly used uh, um, device using the strain gauge principle. You can uh, have the various uh, locations as to where you can uh, place it. Uh, it can be placed in parenchyma, subdurally, uh, can be used as a bolt and can be placed in the ventricle. So commonly, I think we use a parenchymal uh, monitor. Uh, so micro transducer devices, the advantages over the uh, EBD is that it has a relative ease of placement, continuous monitoring, and uh, the lower complication rates of infection and hemorrhage. The disadvantages is that there is a potential for a drift over time. So the, the zero drift phenomenon takes place with uh, these uh, micro transducers. So catheter once it is uh, in place, it cannot be re-zeroed. Also, there is high cost, uh, these um, prohibitively high cost, which are uh, uh, decline, which do not allow the smaller hospitals to use these uh, equipment. And uh, it may not be uh, accurate uh, uh, estimation if you are placed in the CSF pressure, if there are pressure gradients which uh, develop. So it might be in the middle of a gradient, which might be a er erroneous uh, value. So ICP waveform, again quickly just going through it, the ICP waveform can be obtained. So there are many types of ICP waveforms. So the one which are, we are discussing here is the arterial uh, waveform of the um, ICP. There are also respiratory waveforms and there are the slow waveforms of the vasogenic waveforms. So in the uh, arterial waveform, what we have, it resembles the arterial wave. It has a percussion wave, tidal wave and a dichrotic wave, which are named as P1, P2 and P3. Uh, in the normal compliance, in the normal brain with normal ICP, P1 is greater than P2, which is greater than P3, and these peaks are in decreasing height. So if the ICP starts to increase or the brain compliance starts to decrease, the morphology of the waveform starts to change. Generally, P1 will become lesser than P2, and if the ICP continues to increase, there will be a rounding of the waveform, and the, all these details will start to get lost. So in which patients should we be doing this ICP monitoring? This is given to us by the BTF Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines and a previous uh, consensus of uh, the Milan consensus conference. So the BTF tells us that if there is a salvageable patient with severe uh, traumatic brain injury and abnormal CT scan, so obviously we have to do the um, ICP monitoring. Also salvageable pa uh, patients with severe TBI and normal scan uh, can also be taken up for uh, ICP monitoring if they fulfill certain criteria. The Milan consensus, on the other hand, tells that ICP monitoring is generally not recommended in comatose patients with initial normal CT findings. What they say is that after some time, we have to do a routine second CT scan. And if there is a radiological worsening, then uh, ICP monitoring can be done. So as we know, normal ICP ranges between 7 and 15 millimeter mercury in a supine adult. Uh, the raised ICP for a uh, long time has been associated, I mean, with multiple studies, has been associated with higher mortality and poor long-term functional outcome. The BTF recommends that uh, treatment needs to be instituted if the ICP is equal to or greater than 22. So, but there has been a trial which has gained a lot of controversy also, the best trip trial, which found that uh, three-month and six-month outcomes were similar in patients in whom treatment was guided by ICP and uh, in the other group in which the treatment was guided by imaging and clinical examination in the absence of ICP monitoring. So we will not go into this too much, but this uh, this trial uh, basically demonstrates that you cannot have a size fits all policy for all patients. So each treatment has to be individualized and the interpretation of the ICP values has to be in association with other neuromonitoring values. So we'll not go into this too much. So now we are discussing basically the ICP monitoring modalities. So first one was the um, ventricular catheter and the microtransducer devices. Now using ultrasound, we can have an estimation of the ICP. Chronic ICP elevation, it uh, alters the morphology of the optic nerve. So the optic nerve sheath diameter is one of the uh, uh, parameters that we can use on the bedside. 
so optic nerve sheath since it is continuous with the csf intracranially if there is a rise or chronic rise in icp it will dilate or it will make the onst larger so the onst is measured at a point which is 3 mm behind the globe or the posterior aspect of the globe it is used um, uh, at that point is used and the line perpendicular to it is drawn and the onst is measured so onst if it is below 5 mm uh, it it signifies that it, it is normal icp uh, if it is more than 6 mm it represents that the icp is more than 20 so it has uh, generally a good sensitivity and uh, specificity it might have slight inter observer variability but if you want to reduce that inter observer variability a, a trend of um, onst needs to be taken rather than a single value so using transcranial doppler also we can get an idea of the icp transcranial doppler as you know measures the velocity of the blood through the intracranial vessels so there is a index which we can calculate uh, through the transcranial doppler once we are insinuating the uh, generally the middle cerebral artery uh, so what we can do is we can uh, uh, do something called as the pulsatility index pulsatility index basically means the pulse pressure which is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure is divided by the mean uh, uh, blood flow velocity the mean uh, so mean um, systolic not not pressure exactly systolic velocity minus diastolic velocity by the mean velocity so that gives us the pulsatility index and this pulsatility index has a cut off of about 1.35 so if the value of the pulsatility index is more than 1.35 it is around 100% sensitive and 97% specific for icp more than 20 so this is according to multiple studies so this is another modality bedside which in which we can check the icp another uh, recent advance is the pupillometry pupillometry basically is assessing the uh, pupillary response so in a elevated icp or uh, herniation or edema uh, so this can alter the pupillary response to light uh, normal icp the pupillary response should elicit around 34 to 36% decrease in size but if there is icp it is associated with a poorer pupillary response that can be measured by this machine so this machine generally measures the pupillary size its constriction the dilatation velocity and the latency so all these measurements are taken and is fed into an algorithm which is uh, gives a standardized score so which is called as the npi score so npi score if it is 3 or more it indicates that it's a normal pupillary response if it is less than 3 and uh, it generally indicates that it is a uh, condition in which the icp levels are a high and it might give you again a non invasive bedside way bedside tool to uh, determine that the icp is high so now that we have uh, calculated icp we want to calculate this uh, uh, property which is the cerebral perfusion pressure so cerebral perf uh, perfusion pressure cpp as you know is the difference between mean arterial pressure and intracranial pressure and it can be modified by modifying the map or the icp so accurate calculation requires that the zero reference point basically where the point we are zeroing for both the mean arterial pressure and the icp is the same it has to be the level of the triggers so the guidelines uh, recommend that the cpp should be maintained around uh, 60 to 70 mm of hg after the tbi so what we can do is generally we uh, uh, achieve this by increasing the map or uh, decreasing the icp or both so at the at one point it will be little bit risky if you are using um, only the map to elevate the cpp to very high level suppose you are using a lot of uh, fluid boluses and uh, vasopressors it can precipitate uh, pulmonary complications ards uh, so the concept of targeting an individualized optimal cpp range is gaining, gaining ground another concept here is cerebral auto regulation as you know auto regulation basically is the property of the cerebral uh, arterial or vasculature to maintain a constant cerebral blood flow over a wide range of mean arterial pressure so after tbi auto regulation is generally impaired and the brain becomes more susceptible to uh, secondary insults like the if the uh, hypotension or hypertension occurs so it can lead to a hypoperfusion or a hyperemia so the uh, blood flow might become pressure passive as the autoregulatory zone is narrowed so you can see here that the zone of autoregulation in a patient post tbi is very narrow compared to uh, in a normal patient so it is only in that narrow zone of autoregulation that the uh, arterioles will constrict and dilate according to the change in map 
So out of the range, it becomes pressure passive. So using all these criteria, using all these uh, concepts, uh, we, uh, we derive one index known as the pressure reactivity index. So this currently, uh, to my knowledge, is the uh, most established uh, method to assess the cerebral autoregulation. So pressure reactivity index basically means that we are monitoring uh, continuously uh, the ICP and the uh, mean arterial pressure over a period of four minutes. So what we are seeing is during each observation, whether the ICP and the mean arterial pressure are going in the same direction or going in the opposite direction. So basically what we are seeing in the, in the panels you can see, in the top panel you can see that the mean arterial pressure when it is rising, the ICP is falling. So it indicates a negative correlation. So this is the moving window. So the moving window keeps moving. So it is a moving Pearson correlation. That's what it is known as statistically. So if the uh, mean arterial pressure rises, ICP should fall. That indicates a intact autoregulation. So in case the rise in mean arterial pressure leads to a rise in ICP, so that means there is a positive correlation and this PRX value is positive. So that means there is impaired autoregulation. So uh, the uh, PRX value ranges from minus one to plus one, minus one indicating intact autoregulation, plus one uh, uh, indicating impaired autoregulation. So uh, using this pressure reactivity index, we plot this against cerebral perfusion pressure. And at what cerebral perfusion pressure, the PRX becomes most negative, becomes the optimal cerebral perfusion pressure for that patient. So we use this, sorry, we use this PRX value and we continuously chart it with the, or um, we make a graph and we chart it with the cerebral perfusion pressure and generally we obtain a U-shaped graph. So at which value of CPP the PRX becomes most negative, that is the optimal CPP for that patient. So this concept of optimal CPP being individualized to each patient is great gaining ground and this is what is currently being used. So this has a good uh, prediction of mortality and functional outcome after TBI. Water regulation testing can be done using any parameter which is a surrogate of cerebral blood flow. Here we have used ICP, ICP in which we have uh, indicated that whether the pressure uh, like the um, uh, intracranial pressure if it is high indicating that there might be a, um, a low cerebral perfusion or low cerebral blood flow. So if the cerebral blood flow um, and uh, sorry, the, like using any other uh, surrogate of cerebral blood flow, which may be like NIRS or uh, TCD or brain tissue oximetry, if there is an increase or in the correlation, which is like a positive correlation between the mean arterial pressure and the cerebral blood flow or the cerebral oxygenation, or cerebral blood flow velocity, if they go in the same direction, then that means that there is impaired autoregulation. Basically, if the correlation between uh, any of these indices and mean arterial pressure is positive, that means that the autoregulation is impaired. So, uh, why we generally, uh, I mean, it is not used in many of the places because it is time consuming, costly, not widely available, requires a uh, uh, signal processing and automated analysis requires a lot of computer software and uh, uh, know-how about, about technology. So the lower cost option what may be employed is minute by minute assessment of ICP and MAP manually. And this may be uh, relevant uh, if, if we are using it appropriately. This also might give us information about autoregulation monitoring. So this is one, uh, if I'll skip through this, this is the Seattle International Severity a severe traumatic brain injury consensus conference. So this is the tier based management based on ICP. Since we are discussing ICP, I wanted to put this slide as this is the tier based ICP, how to manage traumatic brain injury based on tier one, tier two, tier three. So tier one generally uh, is what we do our usual, um, like we optimize the CPP in a, a adequate sedation, analgesia, normothermia, normocapnia, all those things. So if those things are still not allowing the ICP to come down, we go to tier two, tier two, generally we use neuromuscular paralysis and we give a, a mean arterial pressure challenge to check the cerebral autoregulation status. So if still uh, using that data also, if you're not able to um, optimize the CPP, we go to tier three, 
tier 3 in which the anesthetic uh, coma is induced and the um, uh, and is titrated to icp control so or we might even go for a decompressive craniectomy so this tier approach is useful so that if students if they are watching this might come in exam so this they might ask as it is so cerebral blood flow the next monitor what we can use is cerebral blood flow it is the most direct indicator of oxygenation and fuel delivery uh, so most commonly what we use uh, uh, on the bedside so what we can use as imaging as we discussed uh, ct perfusion pet ct can be used but we can't use it uh, continuously or at the bedside so we generally use something uh, which we can use on non invasively commonly used uh, uh, in mode is the transcranial doppler transcranial doppler as we discussed already uh, it uh, non invasively uh, uses the ultrasound and the doppler principle to get the uh, red blood cell velocity in the field of view so transcranial doppler waveform resembles a arterial uh, pressure graph and arterial pressure graph okay, from that we can calculate certain uh, indices and can give us an idea about the uh, icp so recent uh, meta analysis they reveal that the patient with abnormal tcd findings after tbi uh, such as mean flow velocity of more than 120 or mean flow velocity less than 35 or pulse tilt index of more than 1.2 have a nine fold higher likelihood of mortality similarly if there is hypoperfusion uh, flow velocity less than 35 it has a uh, three fold higher likelihood of poor out poor outcome uh, t- uh, uh, traumatic brain injury can also have uh, vasospasm post uh, traumatic sh and post traumatic uh, vasospasm it is a possible uh, possibility and uh, uh, transcranial doppler findings of vasospasm uh, which is mean uh, uh, mca velocity of more than 120 are associated with three fold higher likelihood of poor outcome so this we can use to uh, non invasively risk free or a portable way to uh, assess the um, cerebral uh, compliance or the cerebral hemodynamics and the response to any treatment so on the left we are seeing the panel so that basically uh, shows the change of the doppler uh, transcranial doppler waveform with increasing uh, icp so from a normal waveform it starts to deform and become a, a more uh, a vertically spiked sort of a waveform the diastolic uh, uh, velocity decreases and the systolic velocity increases eventually it, we are left with isolated uh, systolic spikes and uh, if the uh, icp continues to increase there is diastolic reversal of flow followed by circulatory arrest so this we will skip through this i think thermal diffusion flow metry is the other uh, 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 mode through which we are uh, using the cerebral blood flow uh, so it basically has two sensors uh, both are temperature sensors which uh, uh, which determine the temperature around them and if Uh, so it will be a small amount of uh, temperature the gradient is created which is equated as the blood flow between uh, between these two areas so it gives a uh, you need to uh, uh, do a bur hole and uh, place it in the area which is at risk so it uh, has limited clinical data and there are concerns over its reliability but there are there is strong uh, uh, co- association with uh, cerebral blood flow values of less than 20 ml and uh, it's uh, uh, and the poor neurological outcome so next monitor is cerebral oxygenation so we have gone through icp monitoring we have gone through the cerebral blood flow monitors and we are now coming to cerebral oxygenation cerebral oxygenation is um, uh, it is a, it is the cerebral ischemia which we, it, will, it will detect the cerebral ischemia which is reported to still occur even if the icp and cpp values are within the accepted thresholds cerebral oxygenation monitoring provides us a uh, information about the cerebral oxygen delivery and its utilization and thereby it gives us an idea about the adequacy of perfusion so the methods by which we can ascertain uh, uh, cerebral oxygenation is jugular bulb oximetry uh, and uh, intraparenchymal oxygen monitor basically the uh, brain tissue oximetry and non invasively through the nirs near infrared spectroscopy so coming first to the jugular venous oxygen saturation the monitoring of the sjvo2 can be uh, used to again deliver uh, the, the delivery and uh, utilization in, in a global sense so this catheter is inserted into uh, generally the right side so we have to first ascertain which is the dominant side dominant side of the uh, dominant basically the uh, internal jugular has a dominant and non dominant side so it is to be inserted into the dominant side generally it is the right side which is 
which is the dominant. So it can be the dominant side can be identified using ultrasound examination of the IJB. It has uh, it's larger on the dominant side. Uh, sometimes uh, you can do it on a, uh, a CT scan and see which side jugular foramen is the larger. So why we need it to be on the dominant side is so that the uh, extracranial contamination is minimized. So you want the uh, uh, blood flow or the uh, venous saturation which is representative of only the cerebral circulation, not the extra extracranial circulation. So it is imperative that the uh, uh, position of the catheter is in the correct place. Otherwise, these values are not, are not reliable. So the position has to be checked using a lateral cervical spine x-ray and it has to be near in the jugular bulb. So the measurement of this uh, SJVO2 can be made either by intermittent sampling or continuously by a fiber optic catheter. So um, as we said, uh, it, it re represents the global um, uh, flow weighted measure and it may miss a regional ischemia. So initially it was uh, enthusiastically being used, but now uh, the brain tissue oximetry is taking uh, more of a, uh, is, is more in the uh, limelight. So we'll go to one, sorry, we have an algorithm for this. So the normal values for this is between, so SJVO2 is between 55 and 75. So if it is less than 55, it is basically saying that the uh, uh, ratio between the cerebral uh, blood flow delivery and the blood utilization is low. So it may be due to uh, certain causes. So we go to the causes first. So if there is decreased in blood flow due to ICP or uh, raised ICP, which is uh, eventually due to uh, low arterial pressure or uh, 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 low perfusion pressure. Also, it can be due to the high utilization or increase in the CMRO2, which can be due to seizures or pyrexia. So if it is high and the value is more than 80%, so it is uh, showing that there is a mismatch between the blood flow and the oxygenation in the other sense that the uh, delivery is much more than the requirement. So that can happen in cerebral hyperemia, decreased CMRO2 if there is failure of oxygen utilization that such as mitochondrial failure or brain death. So in this you can see that uh, just how to troubleshoot this is that in case the value is less than 55, you rule out whether it is due to cerebral vasoconstriction due to low PSEO2. And then if it is, that is ruled out, then you check the ICP. So if the ICP is less than 20, basically if it is normal, then we have the possibility that the patient's utilization is more. So you have to investigate if there is any seizure. So you have to do a post-traumatic seizure or cortical spreading depolarization. So in case the uh, SGBO2 is low and the ICP is high, so that may be due to an evolving intracranial pathology, consider a CT brain, um, and uh, make sure that there is um, uh, all the ICP lowering measures have been instituted. So in case of um, SGVO2 being high, again, uh, just check the ICP. If the ICP is high again, so it might uh, be due to another, again an intracranial pathology, which might be a very severe pathology. Again, consider doing a CT brain and again, consider uh, all the uh, uh, modalities to decrease the ICP. So the next modality is the brain tissue partial pressure or the brain tissue oximetry. So this has the most robust evidence base of all of these bedside cerebral oxygenation monitors. So it is a focal measure. So the catheter uh, is uh, placed in uh, the area of interest and generally into uh, the non-traumatized tissue. Uh, generally, at, uh, it is not placed in the pericontusional tissue. So if you're placing it near the, near the contusion, you might get wrong values again. So the technology through which it uh, operates is called as optical luminescence or it is called as the polarographic technique. So the commonly used system is called as the LIFOX system, uses the polarographic technique and uh, that uh, type of uh, microcatheter. So this PBTO, PBTO2 value is influenced by global and cerebral uh, determinants. So you have to make sure that the partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, FiO2, hemoglobin, cardiac output, all those things, which are the systemic variables have to be optimized apart from the cerebral, va cerebral variables. So ICP, CPP, autoregulation, metabolism, seizures, etc., are the cerebral variables. So the PBTO2 value is determined by a combination of both of these. 
So the normal PPTO2 value is between 20 to 40, and um, uh, values less than 20 indicate brain ischemia. So PPTO2 value can provide information uh, to assess whether the oxygen delivery is uh, adequate, and it can also uh, reveal uh, non-perfusion related brain hypoxia when CPP is at the target level. So what again we can uh, use is that we can have a uh, algorithm such as if the PBTO2, so we have written it here as uh, less than two kilopascal, basically it means around 15, 7.5 um, mmHg is one kilopascal. So if PBTO2 is less than two, so you restore um, the PBTO2 uh, to the high value again, you administer an O2 challenge, FIO2 of 100% for two minutes and ensure that it is working properly. So with your FIO2 challenge, if the PBTO2 goes up, that means that the PBTO2 is uh, functioning properly. After that, you ensure uh, the systemic uh, uh, variables are uh, optimized, so such as lung function, partial pressure of oxygen, FiO2. You see a chest radiograph and see if there are infiltrates. You add PEEP, aspirate pulmonary secretions. So these are the lung related, then optim optimize oxygen transport. So make sure that the uh, hemodynamics are adequate, whether the BP is low, and check for hemoglobin and administer blood if the patient is uh, anemic. Then after that, after you've ruled out these systemic uh, causes, you come to the cerebral causes and um, uh, ascertain whether the ICP is raised or not. If the ICP is raised, then again, you institute all measures to decrease the ICP and also check whether there is an increased metabolic demand, such as pain, anxiety, fever, and check an EEG if you feel that the patient might be having seizures. So this is how we uh, 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 classify it. So if the ICP and PBTO2 are checked, if the ICP is high and the PBTO2 is normal, that means that there might be an impending uh, brain herniation or impending risk of uh, any future hypoxia. So we need to be very vigilant if the ICP is high and the PBTO2 is low. If the ICP is high and the PBTO2 is, um, uh, sorry, if the uh, ICP is normal and the PBTO2 is low, that means the pathology might be in the extracranial, in the systemic side. So as we discussed before, so we check all the systemic variables and again come back to it. So while using multimodality monitoring, we come across graphs like these. So till now what we have discussed uh, are all encapsulated in, in the same, in a real-time manner. So in a multimodality monitoring, we will get waveforms like this. So we have on the top cerebral perfusion pressure, in the middle ICP, after that is pressure reactivity index and the PBTO2. So as you can see uh, that ICP value, when it is lesser, the CPP is higher, the PRX is more negative and the PBTO2 is higher. So, so this, gives us a, a holistic sort of a view in which you can correlate each modality with another. So this is how the usually we will do the multimodality monitoring in a combination. So for completion sake, we will go through some of the other monitors. So near infrared spectroscopy, it is a non-invasive technique. It, is, it works on the Beer-Lambert law. It um, uh, basically the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have characteristic absorption spectra. So basically the near NIRS monitor uh, gives relative concentrations of uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin and gives us a value which is uh, uh, essentially the cerebral oxygen saturation. So this uh, this is again a regional uh, tissue uh, uh, oxygen oxygen saturation. It is just uh, the it is giving the values of the uh, tissue brain tissue which is just below where the sensor is uh, uh, connected. So the normal range, uh, normal they have written in, I have written in um, uh, inverted commas because there is no validated uh, regional cerebral saturation. Uh, there is no defini defined ischemic thresholds to guide ther therapeutic interventions in NIRS. So the normal range should be between 60 and 75. So if there is a low cerebral oxygenation value, again, make sure that all the uh, CPP and uh, these parameters are uh, kept to optimal levels. Uh, the good quality data is not available generally, so there are some uses of hematoma detection based on optical density. This is a handheld uh, NIRS which uh, has been used to uh, detect hematoma basically in a non-invasive manner. So uh, other studies, other uh, indications need more uh, data. So we'll go to the next one. 
So brain metabolism and biochemistry. Uh, this basically what we're discussing is cerebral microdialysis. Cerebral microdialysis is another invasive technique in which we detect the secondary brain injury by the implantation of a probe. So we will have a probe inside the brain at the area which is at risk. So the tip of this uh, microdialysis catheter. So this is the microdialysis catheter. The tip of this incorporates a semi-permeable dialysis membrane. So what happens is from a pump, perfusate is pumped in to the microdialysis uh, catheter and subsequently after the uh, perfusate is pumped in after some time we see that due to diffusion of molecules through the semi-permeable membrane the diacylate basically the substance from near the brain tissue that starts to uh, come into the uh, system and that is analyzed by um, by um, by this machine by the cerebral microdialysis so the perfusate uh, uh, allows the uh, perfusate and diacylate basically are like a uh, irrigation system through which the uh, brain uh, compounds are taken in and analyzed so this basically gives us uh, uh, some um, uh, idea about the uh, biochemical uh, environment near the area at risk. So what happens here is that energy dysfunction, which is recognized as a key uh, factor in pathological TBI. So what happens is we measure uh, lactate pyruvate ratio and we have also uh, LPR. So that is the main um, uh, uh, parameter that we'll be measuring through the cerebral microdialysis. So cerebral microdialysis uh, measures the lactate and pyruvate and gives it as a ratio. So lactate pyruvate ratio with low pyruvate indicates that there is profound reduction in energy substrate supply. So this is basically classic ischemia. So elevated LPR with low pyruvate. So another uh, thing that can happen is elevated LPR with normal or high pyruvate. This indicates non-ischemic cause related to mitochondrial dysfunction with or without an increased metabolic demand. So basically what we are looking for is the lactate pyruvate ratio. And uh, after that, we will also be seeing uh, glutamate, which is another marker of hypoxia and ischemia uh, and excitotoxicity. Glycerol is a marker for hypoxia, ischemia related cell membrane breakdown. So these uh, changes what occur in the brain uh, cellular level, it has the potential to identify the cerebral compromise before changes in other monitored variables. So uh, this uh, um, technology uh, can also detect the uh, periods of low brain glucose concentration and it is combined with the elevated lactate pyruvate ratio. Uh, so lactate pyruvate ratio, if it is more than 40, it suggests severe hypoxia and correlates with poor outcome. So neuroglycopenia is uh, another uh, uh, similar Another, another similar uh, concept in which after TBI, the normal relationship between serum glucose, glycemic control and brain glucose may be lost and uh, the brain glucose may fall to levels that are insufficient. So uh, uh, if the brain extracellular fluid glucose level is very low, which is around 0.2 millimole per liter, a trial of increasing serum glucose concentration has been recommended to um, uh, minimize the burden of uh, this neuroglycopenia. So uh, amongst these uh, technologies, uh, this uh, lactate pyruvate ratio has been used to guide the CPP management. So we come to the limitations. Uh, so limitations is there's a poor temporal resolution. It may miss short-lived but important changes in brain tissue chemistry, including those by neuro um, electrophysiological abnormalities such as particle spread depolarization. Uh, there is something called as the insertion effect, which occurs in the first six hours after placement of the microdialysis probe, in which the values which are obtained are unreliable. Now, finally, coming to electrophysiological uh, um, uh, monitoring, so electroencephalography. So seizures occur in about 20 to 40 percent of the TBI patients, and early detection, detect, detection, and treatment are crucial to minimize the seizure-related burden. So continuous EEG monitored is, uh, monitoring is recommended in patients with post-traumatic seizure to guide the anticonvulsant therapy. And uh, since there is a high incidence of non-convulsive seizures after TBI, so this continuous EEG monitoring can be used if the patient's uh, neurological condition is not improving. So integration of these um, 
uh, continuous EEG identifies if there is association between uh, seizures, intracranial hypertension, uh, cerebral metabolic uh, derangements, oximetry, etc. can be taken in toto and can be correlated. Uh, so this also forms part of the multimodality monitoring. So if there is an EEG burst activity, it is shown to proceed and increase in ICP around 80% of the time. So intracranial EEG, uh, we can use uh, these uh, intracranial EEG, which is different from the surface EEG, that we use these probes, which are in the subcortical region of the brain. So these are the only ones which can pick up the cortical spreading depolarization, which is an important cause of the secondary brain injury. So these um, uh, uh, cortical spreading depolarization can be only picked up by these depth EEG probes. So uh, these depth EEG probes also have the advantage that they have a less um, or a very high signal to noise ratio, very less noise and a very clear, clear signal as compared to the surface EEG. Finally, coming to the evoke potentials, the two uh, commonly used evoke potentials uh, for TBI in ICU are the um, SCCPs and the um, brainstem audiometry evoked responses. So they have limited uh, utility, um, even though they are non invasive, rel relatively inexpensive uh, diagnostic and prognostic tools. So generally, we can use them after CPR, after TBI, and for confirmation of brain death. So this brainstem audiometry evoked response is uh, sensitive to the uh, quantum mesencephalic integrity. So it has shown that uh, in, in BERA, uh, the changes in the, uh, the, uh, the wave 5 and the wave 5 latency can be used as a marker for transtentorial herniation or increased ICP. So it can also be used as an alternative, alternative to monitor brainstem compression in comatose patients who are at high risk of uh, increased ICP. Now, finally, uh, since we have discussed all these things, uh, uh, the final challenge is to integrate all these multimodality neuromonitoring data. Uh, there are many benefits uh, such as uh, like simultaneous uh, measurement of ICP and brain tissue oximetry uh, seems to be a logical approach since a single probe can capable, is capable of monitoring both. So computational analysis and integration of all these monitoring together will be of use. So you can see here, this is something called as a triple bolt. Uh, these contains, uh, so this is basically placed through a frontal burr hole, uh, generally on the non-dominant side. And uh, uh, from top to bottom, it is the Lycox PBTO2 probe, the microdialysis probe, and the intraparenchymal Codman ICP pressure probe. So these, when they are taken together, then the as we uh, saw in one, another um, uh, slide, that these waveforms can be superimposed one on top of each other and uh, uh, conclusions can be made as to what is the underlying cause for the uh, patient's improvement or patient's deterioration or uh, how to approach the uh, next step of the treatment. So again, here we are seeing uh, how the all the monitoring modalities are overlapped over each other. So we have the EEG, CPP, uh, ICP monitoring, and all of these are time locked together. Basically, all of them uh, show that it is in the at the same time. So here we have an example, another example, a schematic example. So here we have the ICP in arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, PBTO2, cerebral uh, blood flow in a time locked fashion. So here we are seeing that the ICP increases and leads to a decrease in the CPP and the PBTO2 decreases when there is that increased um, increased ICP. So this this can give us a clear cut a picture as to what change is due to which phenomenon. So this in the future, maybe you will have a, a conceptual drawing like this, that one catheter which will be inserted into the brain and all kinds of monitors will be attached to it. So this they are calling it as a lab on a tube for multimodal monitoring. So eventually we will reach this stage in which all the monitors are connected onto one single probe and that one single probe, we can monitor all the parameters. So I will end it at this. Uh, thank you for listening. And this, uh, sir, sir can contribute uh, his valuable opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you covered extensively all the multimodal neuromonitoring in traumatic brain injury patient, there is nothing much I can contribute on this. As you rightly pointed out, uh, it's uh, they are all very costly. Uh, this one actually, 
monitoring uh, either the whether you cost of the sensors or the cost of monitors all are pretty costly as of now and i am not very sure how many hospitals in india can afford other than obviously grants for uh, research purposes from some of the either companies or from the icmr dst like that so as you rightly pointed out ct is the one which is easily can be done the only issue is the transport is the major issue and so many things can be missed like the electrophysiological activity or the metabolism everything can be missed so this is the time for uh, multimodal monitoring and it can uh, lead to as uh, there are uh, several small studies which have shown that uh, the multimodal monitoring is going to be uh, contributing to that uh, improvement in the survival in these group of patients and uh, but the only time will tell that how these monitors will be integrated with each other and uh, as of now it looks uh, it, it it is uh, promising it looks promising but in the coming years maybe that it may become routine like how we use that uh, i cannot imagine now in this time uh, doing a neuro case without a, a gas analyzer etco to ecg pulse oximeter whereas uh, 20 years back it was not the norm like uh, there were some motives where only pulse oximeter was there ecg was not available like that maybe 20 years down the line we'll be seeing that everything is available and you have to do there is a monitor which you shown last i hope that can come into routine practice and the one of the main thing the industry what has to take care is to reduce the sensor costs yeah. because the recurring costs are so much that uh, none of the hospital administration will be ready to procure uh, even the paying patients so it's very difficult to uh, uh, like uh, and there are some limitations still so i am sure that with the ai coming up in a big way everything and uh, we will be able to address those new nuances easily only thing is the cost will still be the constraint but 20 years down the line i am still very hopeful that by the time i retire from neuro anesthesia and neuro critical care definitely this will be the possibility and my junior is going to scold me sir aapko kuch nahi aata <laughs> i would love to hear that from my junior that sir aapko kuch nahi aata <laughs> so thank you anak for your extensive uh, coverage of this and the advantage of our classes are the all the videos which you have done the class now and the previous videos all are available in the classroom and you can go on uh, i know it's a saturday and it's very difficult for people to join in and still the, there are many students who might be in the ot so they can go in their free time and watch those videos and like them and subscribe to our channel classroom which is an initiative of isnac and ncsi uh, hope uh, to see you more and more anag contributing to ncsi and thank, thank, thank you once again thank you anything else you want to add on this from my side sir the same thing sir the cost factor remains the stumbling block i work in a private uh, hospital and uh, that feasibility is just not there the codman icp monitors we discussed about the possibility of using those but mm. it is just way too expensive we yeah. can possibly we can pos- i mentioned in one line uh, that uh, we might be able to manually uh, like when we were, when i was talking about uh, that prx the pressure reactivity index so if we are using a evd um, for um, icp monitoring and we also have um, arterial line for mean arterial pressure monitoring so we can like manually the, do the like minute by minute icp versus uh, the mean arterial pressure graphing and maybe we can use i have personally not done that but i'm like postulating or suggesting that we can do it instead of having that many computing and all that software technology we yeah, can yeah. Try, that we software can try that. yeah that software i think it is from cambridge i see yes, plus and still it is not widely available everywhere so yes, it is still, uh, very costly to procure also and other than other part of some research project which they initiate multi center so having said yes. that i think uh, we should not uh, uh, discourage learning we should keep learning and discussing about these things as i said uh, 20 years back we were using exactly. Nokia. exactly it will come it surely by the time we, i am at least my career is ending we will be seeing this yeah. see we were, the technology is developing so fast we were at yeah. the nokia 3310 just <laughs> and now we are with the 
most advanced uh, the software and the now the, now the neural link has come to the brain yeah. chip directly <laughs> in the brain now. yeah so the, the there will be some implantable chip i feel in future mm. and it will give all with the ai without yes. any cables and all hanging around the head we'll be able to get all the data from that so yes, thank you anand thank you for your contribution to the classroom thank and thank you so we much. hope to see and listen to you more and more thank you yes. punaya for uh, wonderfully organizing the classes like this thank you Bond to sindhu to because yeah. uh, yeah, see sindhu also <laughs> so we are in the pillar for ncsi now yes so yes and uh, talent and she is taking care of the ncsi thank you both punaya and sindhu and and we'll meet you again with one more uh, i think the journal club the next one in the next uh, june first week thank you and oh, and uh, have a good weekend right sir thank you goodbye goodbye we can stop live them yeah right mm. apa <laughs> <laughs>